for me. Maybe not you. So we'll start off with semi-easy stuff. Um, we'll go back to, remember Farmer Joe and his fence? We're going to go back to Farmer Joe and his fence today. And you're going to hate that problem because now you're going to actually have to do something with it. Uh, so, first thing up, quadratic functions, really quickly. This is 3, 1. Quadratic functions. Do you remember quadratic equations? They're coming back in a variety of ways. Factoring, perfect square method, completing the square. Remember all that junk? We're going to do it all again really quickly today, but not solving-wise, but doing something else with it. We're going to be graphing these things perfectly. It's not going to be a sketch. It's actually going to be a graph because it will be uh, five points you have to graph. All right, so quadratic function, general form. Looks like this. And the only condition is a cannot equal zero. Of course, if a equaled zero, this would either be a, well, it would be a linear function if a equals zero. So if you got rid of the square, all you've got left is a linear equation, you're talking about a line. To make this a quadratic function, you have to have that x squared term. All right, so that's what the general form looks like. The general graph looks something like this. It's called a parabola. I think that's spelled right. Yeah. No, no, my spelling. No. So it's called a parabola. It has this nice little U shape to it. it. Has some nice little features. Feature number one: a parabola is symmetrical. That means there's a line that goes smack dab down the middle of it. Where if you pick any point on the right-hand side, it flips over this uh, dotted line, and it shows up on the other side, of it, just like a mirror image. Um, this line has a special name. It's called the axis of symmetry. Parabolas are really important. Um, most headlamps work on the concept of parabolas. They have a neat little feature that they shine light straight out. Flashlights, they have a parabolic shape to them on the inside so that when the light bulb flashes, it shines straight out rather than diffusing. So it's kind of a neat shape. But you don't need to know that. That's physics. All right, another uh, little thing about parabolas. The intersection between the axis of symmetry and the graph itself, this point right here, this is called a vertex. Now, a vertex is either an absolute minimum. In this case, it's the absolute minimum because it's at the bottom. Poorest person in the world. If you flip the graph upside down, it becomes an absolute maximum because he's the richest person in the world. Um, other things of interest. It'll sometimes have x-intercepts. It could have two. It could have one if the vertex was the only thing touching the x-axis. And if you push this high enough, it could have actually have absolutely no x-intercepts at all, because it would be going up but away from the x-axis. And it'll always have this baby over here, that's the y-intercept. So y-intercept, and of course our x-intercepts. Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes none. You never go with that one. Now the last point that I'm going to be looking for, so that right now that's one, two, three, four. I said there was five of them. Where's the fifth one going to come from? Nice little storm. I even brought my umbrella today. So where's the fifth point going to come from? Well, remember this axis of symmetry? I have this y-intercept up here, and he doesn't have a matching pair. Notice the x-intercepts have matching pairs. One on the left side of it, and one on the right side. So here's this y-intercept sitting here all by himself. So I should be able to go across the way and find this point over here. I'll call it a reflected point. And it's basically just the reflected y-intercept. So you get those five points and you can draw a nice curve through all five of them. Makes sense, right? A little bit? Oh, let's just do one. 
This might be an example. Um, first type. It's called the perfect square format. Generally, I don't mess around with it too much. This is the nice format. Because if it's in this format, your vertex is HK. Kind of like a circle. What does the K do to the graph? Well, it moves it up or down K units. What does the H do to the graph? Well, it moves it left or right H units. And it literally lands the vertex at H comma K. All right, so for example, what if I want to graph this function? things I want to find out. Number one, I want to find the vertex, the axis symmetry, the x-intercepts, the y-intercept, and the reflected point. So the picture pretty much tells you what you need to find. You just have to go and find it. It doesn't matter what order you go in, but you generally just try to steal information right off of that. Information number one, I should be able to find the vertex. So what's the vertex of this parabola? Close, no cigar. Remember, inside parentheses, opposite direction. Three to the left, so that would make it. <coughs> Where are you if you're three to the left? Negative three. So this would be negative three, four. So your vertex has been shifted from the origin, three units to the left and four units up. All right, what about axis of symmetry? How do I write the equation of a vertical line? What does it start with? X equals or Y equals? X. X. So this is going to be X equals. Now remember, the axis of symmetry and the vertex are intersections, the parabola and the axis of symmetry. So when I talk about the axis of symmetry and I'm saying X is equal to, well, what's X equal to? These two have to intersect each other. The only thing they have in common is what? Is it going to be 4? No, 4 is a y value. Negative 3 is the x value. So the axis of symmetry is negative 3. x equals negative 3. It's a vertical line. And on that line lies the point negative 3, 4. All right. Uh, what else can I find? Easily. Well, semi-easily. What other points on this graph that I'm looking for? I've got my vertex, I've got my axis of symmetry, what else can I look for? Y-intercept. How do I find a y-intercept of any graph? How do you find the y-intercept of a graph? If you're sitting at this y-intercept over here, what's the only guaranteed coordinate? <coughs> Which one's zero? X. X is zero. So when you're looking for a y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. All right, so you go back to your original equation, which is here. And you let x equal 0, so that's f of 0 is equal to negative 0 plus 3. Square it, plus 4. Negative 9 plus 4, not negative 5. Negative 5. So that gives you 0, negative 5 as a coordinate. Now, if you find two y-intercepts, I'm really worried because that's not a function. This is a function. All right, what's the other thing we can find? I got my y-intercept. We'll get the reflected point after we draw the picture. So the only thing left is, how do you find an x-intercept? If you're on the x-axis, what's the only thing that's guaranteed? What's the zero? Y. So you let y equal zero. All right, so if you let y equal zero, that's saying the whole function is equal to zero. How do I solve this mess? Stare at it. Mm. Just solve it regularly. Solve it regularly. <laughs> so what would you do first? Solve it regularly. 
I love that. Subtract, uh, subtract, subtract four. Subtract. Okay. So you get negative four equals negative x plus three all squared. All right, then change that um divide both one by negative one. So you can square it. Get rid of the negative. So multiply both sides by negative one, they both become positive. And you square both sides. Square both sides. Square both sides. Square both sides. Crap. No, nah, square root both sides. Square root both sides. Uh, square root, it would be the fourth power, and it just makes it messy. So square root this side, square root that side. What do I have to put over here? Plus or minus. Thank you. So it's become plus or minus the square root of four, better known as two. So I'm going to change sides. This becomes x plus three is equal to plus or minus two. Then what? We're going to um, subtract three on both sides. X is equal to negative 3 plus or minus 2. Which are? Um, negative 1 and negative 5. Okay. Negative one and negative five. Okay. How do I plot those? <laughs> what are the coordinates, in other words? What are the coordinates of those two points? Negative one, zero, and negative five, and zero. So we have these two points. We have this point. We have this axis of symmetry. And we have this point, which is the vertex. Okay. Now we can start plotting. Hmm. After you do about 10 of these, it becomes a lot quicker than what I'm doing right now. So if I'm going to, oops, wrong color. If I'm going to graph these. Let's see if I can draw straight lines today. First piece, vertex, negative 3, 4. So 3 to the left, 4 up, here's our vertex. I'll label it with a V just to keep it away from all the other points I'm going to plot. Uh, next up, axis of symmetry, x equals negative 3. Well, that's a vertical line. It's technically not part of the graph. It just gives you that image over portion of the graph. But it's still part of the feature of the graph. Let's put it that way. Um, y intercept, 0, negative 5. He's way over here. 0 on the x axis, straight down 5 units. And then your x intercepts are, where are they? Negative 1, 0. That's here. And negative 5, 0. That's over here. So there's four points that I have plotted. What's the fifth one? How do I find it? Well, if you're going to be reflected over this graph, y-intercept is going to get reflected. How far is he away from the uh, axis of symmetry? Three units. So if you're going to get reflected, that distance isn't going to change. It has to be another three units. So if you move three and three, that's, well, six to the left. Better known as some point way over here. Coordinates are? There's your fifth point. Negative 6, 5, and you can draw your parabola. Remember, this vertex is the highest point, so I highly suggest you start there. Go down on that side, go down on this side. Instead of trying to do it left to right, it's much easier to do it half at a time. And there's your parabola. Domain? Domain? Negative infinity positive. Negative infinity positive. Range? My whisper. Four to something. Four to something? <laughs> What's the smallest value it gets? Negative Highest value it gets? Four. So it's negative infinity to four. Down to here. 
Okay. And there's your graph of your parabola, the quadratic function. Now that is called the perfect square method. You can pull the vertex right out of it right away, and you can pull the axis symmetry right away out of it. And some of the algebra after that isn't that, that bad. X-intercept and Y-intercept are very simplistic. So if I could get everybody into that form, life would be really, really nice. The problem is, it's not always in that form. So what happens if we have something that looks like this? G of x is equal to 3x squared minus 9x plus 11. And I don't want to graph this one. All I'm curious about is what is its vertex and what is its axis of symmetry? Well, the only thing I know what to do now is, if it was in the perfect square form, I could just Gain the information out of it. So my question to you is, how do I make that a perfect square form? What method would you use to make a perfect square? Perfect square. Wow, it's got a very nice name to it, though. It begins with a C. Minus one. What is it? Oh, completing the square. Now, if this was an equation, the first step of completing the square is to get rid of that 3. But it's not an equation, it's a function. So the only thing you can do with the 3 is pull it out. But the 11 has nothing to do with this, so I can push him to the side. The 11, generally, we'd move to the other side, but this is a function. You can't move it to the other side, so the best we're going to be able to do is push it over a little bit. So this is what happens. You get g of x is equal to, kick out the 3, leave a space, and just push the 11 a little bit to the right. So, so far, I really haven't changed a thing. I've just kind of rearranged and a little factoring in the first two terms. What I'm going to do now is show you why you should never do this. Because here comes the common mistake. How do you complete the square on this? What's your next step? You all forgot? Take half of the middle number. So this, I should have picked a different number, but that's okay. This becomes negative 3 halves. And then square it, this becomes positive 9 fourths. Now, if this was an equation, you would have 9 fourths on one side, and you would have 9 fourths on the other side. But you can't do that. So what you have to do is, since I put it here, I have to take it away over there on the same side. It's like saying, I'm adding 2 to it, but to not change it, I'm going to subtract 2 right away. So what should I subtract over here? What is it? 9 fourths, no. What is it? No, negative 3 has nice. nothing to do with this. I should subtract 27 fourths. Because this 3 is sitting out front, and it's distributing and hitting that number. And this is what most people forget, that this number and this number are attached. It just doesn't look like they are. So the mistake that people make is, yeah, they get that 9 fourths there, and then they subtract 9 fourths there, and that messes up the whole thing. It has to be minus 27 fourths, weirdly enough. So I don't like that method for finding the vertex of that form. So what can we do to find the vertex and or axis of symmetry, because either one will work perfectly fine. And it comes back to, what does the graph of a parabola look like? This is my method, not the book's method. Here you have a parabola. The axis of symmetry goes smack dab right through here, right? And it has these two x-intercepts, one on the left, one on the right. So if I look at this line segment right here, what is the axis of symmetry hitting on that little line segment? The horizontal line. I know, but as it hits this horizontal line, it forms a point. What is that point called? Say it. Midpoint. It has to be, because the distance from this point to the axis of symmetry is the same as the other point to the axis of symmetry. That means those two line segments are equal congruent, if you want to go geometry terms. Therefore, that point here is the midpoint. Can I find that midpoint for all quadratic equations? 
And the answer is you better shake your head up and down because it's yes. <laughs> don't say no because you don't want to see it. It's actually not that hard to find. So let's say that graph there is the graph of this function. So what I'm interested in is what are the x-intercepts? Because if I know what the x-intercepts are, all I have to do is find their midpoint. And that will tell me what the axis of symmetry is. Awesome. So what are the x-intercepts of ax squared plus bx plus c? How do I find them? I love how your brains all fall out. You know how to do this, you just don't want to answer. So how do you find an x-intercept of any function? What about zero? Why do make I love when people... Zero? Make y equal zero. Make y equal to zero. So you're solving this equation. Zero equals ax squared plus bx plus c. How do you solve that equation? Quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. Literally, that's where the quadratic formula comes from. So we get x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over... To a. There's two answers there. One on the left, that's the minus one. One on the right, that's the plus one of the plus minus part. So to find the midpoint, what do I need to do to these two coordinates? How do you find the midpoint? Take the two numbers, add them together, and divide by two. So I'm going to add the two coordinates. The left one is negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And I'm going to add that to the right coordinate, which is negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now that's adding the x-coordinates. Now I want to, the well, first thing you said, <laughs> divide it all by and this will be the axis of symmetry, so I'm going to just write x equals up front. Because that'll be the vertical line that is the axis of symmetry. All right, this isn't too bad if you look at it. I mean, it looks horrible right now, but once we do the next step, it crunches right down to almost nothing. The top has a common denominator of 2a. That means I can take the two fractions and just add them. When I add them, what happens to the square root part? Well, that one's negative, and this one is... And a negative plus a positive of the same value is zero. So you get negative b plus negative b, better known as negative 2b, over 2a, all over 2. Or you can multiply everybody by 2a, and you'll get the same answer. It'll probably work, work out a little bit better, but that's all right. What happens to the top two twos? Cancel. They cancel. And if you write this as 2 over 1, how do you simplify a fraction over a fraction? We talked about this earlier. <laughs> how do you divide a fraction by a fraction? Flip that and multiply, right? So keep the top one, which is negative b over a, and multiply by the flip of the bottom one, 1 half, better known as, no, it's not right there, x equals negative b over 2a. And that's your axis of symmetry formula. It's actually a formula. All right. So let's go back to my weird one over there. G of x is equal to, I don't know why this blue marker's dying already, uh, 3x squared minus 9x plus 11. And I just want to find the vertex on this thing. So the first thing you do is you set up the formula. Negative b over 2a. 
Now this little equation only works if it's in standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c. What's b in this case? So it becomes positive 9 over 2 times a, which is 3. So this equals? Um, I know, but which one? There's so many of them. 3 half. 3 half. 3 goes into 9 3 times, 3 over 2. All right, so how do I find the vertex? Plug in what? Being precise. <laughs> There's no equation. I mean, well, no. I know nothing. G. G of three halves. If I know what x is equal to, I always want to find out what y is equal to. So this becomes three times three halves squared minus nine times three halves. Plus 11. Calculators come in handy here. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. So this is 9 fourths times 3, that's 27 fourths, minus 27 halves, plus 11. I'm going to write that as 44 fourths for a specific reason. Common denominator, all that fun stuff. So what's 27 fourths minus 27 halves? Think of it as like one fourth minus one half. What's one fourth minus one half? You have a half of a pie, you lose a quarter of it, you're left with a quarter. <laughs> so 27 fourths minus 27 halves literally is negative 27 fourths plus 44 fourths. Fractions, gotta love them. And that turned out to be, I have no idea. Horrible subtraction. 17 fourths? No. Yeah. 17 fourths? So this gives you 17 fourths. G of 3 halves. So what is the vertex of this parabola? As a coordinate. Stop smiling. <laughs> you can answer that. 3 halves was the x-coordinate, and 17 fourths is the y-coordinate. So from that negative b over 2a mass, you find the axis of symmetry. By the way, this is the axis. x equals 3 halves. Axis. And you find the vertex after you plug in the axis of symmetry. It's not a hard process, it's just, you know, you got to get used to it. So why would we want to learn how to graph this mass? Well, there's some applications we can now do. Aren't you going to say yay? Applications mean what? Oh, word problems, yeah. Physics. Teach you a little physics. Because physics and math are intertwined anyways. Oh, my. Ah, they are. Um, there's this neat little function in physics. It's represented by S of T. Um, the reason they use S, it's weird. It's arc length, even though this has nothing to do with arc length. This is just straight up and down distance. Um, this is free fall. Free fall motion. In other words, if I shoot something straight up in the air, it's going to come straight back down. So it's a linear motion, just straight up and down. What led to go up? What's, what's making it go up? I'm giving it a little force, right? I'm giving it a little velocity out of my hand. So therefore, it'll go up. But then it stops, and then it comes back down. What's making it come down? Gravity. Now, gravity has a hold of this thing all the way through, right? As it goes up and as it comes down. Acceleration due to gravity is always pulling it. So the first part of this is negative... Oh, how do I want to write this?
this. So I'm going to write it as 16. Acceleration due to gravity in feet per second per second is 32 feet per second per second. The number that I'm putting down there is half of it. t squared plus v sub 0 t. Now v sub 0 is how much force I'm actually giving this calf to throw it up. So if I give it a small velocity, it doesn't go very high. If I give it a great velocity, it might touch the ceiling. Does that make sense? So v sub 0 is that, that velocity that I'm giving it. t is just time in seconds. And then lastly is s sub 0. If I'm holding the, the cap four feet off the ground when it launches, then that's s sub 0. And then it eventually falls past my hand to hit the ground. OK. So this v sub 0 is called initial velocity. Velocity is somewhat similar to speed, except if you throw something down, that's negative velocity. If you throw something up, that's positive velocity. It gets a little weird. Or negative speed and positive speed. Um, S sub 0 is just called initial distance off ground. Off the ground. Initial distance off the ground. <sighs> So, here's how it works. For example, way back when, um, a uh, hot air balloon was a thousand start off with simplistic problems. This actually happened. This was at the World's Fair. One year they did it from 500 feet. They dropped a baseball and this catcher was standing down there and he caught the ball and everybody went, yay, right? Then they decided, let's make it even more special. So they went twice the height, 1,000 feet. Hmm? Did he miss it? Oh, no, he caught it. Yeah, but when he caught it, the ball crashed into his face, broke his jaw, crashed into his shoulder, broke his collarbone, and broke his arm. And he passed out. And he still caught the ball, though. It was still in his glove. This is a problem out of one of my calculus books. This is only part of it, though. So way back when, a hot air balloon was 1,000 feet up and dropped a baseball. How long did it take until it hit the ground? So the first thing you do is you set up your function using this thing up here. So you say, well, I have this function, s of t. It starts off with negative 16t squared. If I drop a baseball, what's its initial velocity? Am I throwing it down? Am I throwing it up? I'm just dropping it. So what's its initial velocity? Big old A nog. Zero. Because I'm not getting into anything. So you get plus zero t plus s sub zero, initial distance off the ground. That's easy. A thousand feet. All right. The question then is, how do I find out how long it takes to hit the ground? So when it hits the ground, S of t describes the distance off the ground after a certain period of time. So this really is um, distance off ground after t seconds. So after one second, it falls a certain distance. After two seconds, it falls another distance. I want to know when it falls 1,000 feet. So when I say when it hits the ground, how far off the ground is it when it hits the ground? Zero. Zero. I mean, if your foot is on the ground, it's on the ground. There's no distance between it. So the equation becomes zero is equal to negative 16t squared plus 1,000. How do you solve? How do you solve this silly little equation? You need the formula, right? Oh, please don't. Oh, um, Move a thousand, thousand over. Thousand. Yeah. Negative a thousand is equal to negative 16t squared. Then what? 
Divide, divide by, by negative 16. 16. What's 1,000 divided by 16 approximately? Calculator people. Pink calculator people. Uh, I spray painted my daughters. They had a little thing that used to carve it into it. Yeah. Again, but I didn't want to mess up. I, I spray painted my daughters. The whole thing? The back oh. and the cover. Same color. People are agreeing. What'd you get? Really? That's a long time. Well, no, that's not the answer yet. 62.5 is equal to t squared. All right. How do you solve for t? Square root both sides. Square root both sides. So t is approximately, we want the positive root because it makes no sense to have negative seconds. That'd be in the past, time travel, all that fun stuff. My guess, 7.8. No. Darn it. 7.9. So this thing takes 7.9 seconds to fall a thousand feet. Now, if you think about this, if you're a thousand feet off and you decide to kill yourself and you jump, <laughs> you have eight seconds to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, think one, two, three. I mean, I'm going to die, and you know this for eight seconds. I couldn't do it that way. I couldn't do it, period. All right. The fun part is finding its velocity, but I can't show you that part. That's calculus. It's, sad. it's an easy formula, but. That's how long it would take to hit the ground. So you just set it equal to zero. So what happens if I change the problem just slightly? For example, um, a rifle has a muzzle. Oh, I spelled this right. Yeah, velocity of 400 feet. Per second. Might be a BB gun, I don't know. <laughs> um, a bullet is shot straight up. I wonder what happened. All right, so rifle, muzzle velocity, 400 feet per second, shoots a bullet straight up in the air, and you anticipate the bullet to come on straight down. Um, you ever seen those westerns? And you're all shooting their guns off up in the air. Don't you ever wonder where the bullets went? Yeah, because if they come down, they have almost the same velocity as when they leave the gun. So that means if it can kill you, it will hit you, and you will get punctured somehow with this bullet. Um, New Year's Eve and 4th of July when those farmers are out there shooting off their rifles, if they don't shoot something other than buckshot, the little pellets, it'll go right through someone's roof and that has caused a few holes in roofs over the years. People don't think about it though, they're like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> shoot the guns off. Um, so what I want to know is how high does this bullet go and how long until it hits the ground? Now when you set up the function, S of t is equal to negative 16 t squared. As long as it's in feet, that first part of the function is not going to change. Then we get to v sub 0. So what's v sub 0 in this case? Now you have to dissect your numbers. 15 feet is a distance. That has nothing to do with velocity. When you're talking about feet per second, that's like miles per hour. And miles per hour is the speed, otherwise known as... A velocity. So when I say v sub zero, out of those two numbers, which one is it? It's got to be the 400. So this would be 400 times t plus s sub zero. The only thing left is 15. Now, if you just look at this as a quadratic function, it's got a negative t squared. So which way does this graph point? Both up, both down. 
both down, right? It's a positive uh, even exponent and it's negative, so it would be both down. So this thing has a shape that looks something like this. And I'm not continuing it on because the dotted part of the graph we do care less about. So if I'm asking how high does it go, what point am I looking for? And the maximum is also known in parabola terms as fancy name. That point has a fa fancy name. What's that point? Other than absolute max. Vertex. So we need to find the vertex of this parabola. So how do I find the vertex? How do I find the axis? Negative b over 2a. So the first part of the question, I'm going to say, well, not x equals, t equals negative b over 2a. Because our variable here is t, not x. All right, what's b in this case? 400, so this becomes negative 400 over 2 times a, which is negative 16. So whatever the heck negative 400 divided by negative 32 is. 12.5. Wow, that's a long time. Now, this is t equals, so what's the measurement on t? What kind of units does it have? Feet? Meter? Mile? Hour? Feet. Seconds. Um, t is feet. time. Um, <laughs> and it's seconds. So this thing reaches its maximum velocity after 12 and a half seconds of flight. That's quite a long time, and this must be a high-powered supersonic rifle they use to assassinate people with. Because <laughs> normal rifles don't shoot that far up in the... or take that long to get up in the air. All right, does that tell me my vertex? How do I find my vertex? That just tells me how long it took to get to the maximum height. I want to know what the maximum height is. That, plug it in. You want to find the vertex, you take the axis symmetry number and you plug it into your function. So it's going to be S of 12.5, which is equal to negative 16, 12.5 all squared, plus 400 times 12.5, plus 15. And now I need calculator. I am not doing that in my head. And I don't trust one person. I need two people to do it to verify the answer because I've had... One person give me the answer, and it's totally wrong. So the more, the better. Then we can feel confident about the answer. Five people better not make the same mistake. Thank God for calculators. And the answer is good. What amount of time? We'll find out in a second. Because I don't even know what the right answer is, so it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, just tell me. <laughs> 2515? 2515? 2515? 2515? 2515. We've got three people's answers. Okay. So, S of 12.5 is 2515. What's the measurement on this one? Feet. Feet. So this goes up half a mile, a little less than a half a mile up in the air. 5280 is a mile. A little more than a half a mile. No, a little less. 25, yeah, 25. A little less than a half a mile. That's not too bad. All right, so that answers number one. How high does it go? 25, 15 feet. Uh, how long till it hits the ground? Now what do I need to do? Well, how did I find out how long it took to hit the ground over here with Mr. Fairball? Baseball falling out of the hot air balloon. So I had my function, and what did I do to it? Next step. Set it equal to zero. So part two is going to be zero is equal to negative 16 t squared plus 400 t plus 15. I'm not going to solve it. I wish I had my other calculator with me. Now let's solve it. How would you solve this equation? Stare at it. Okay, that didn't work. Next option. Hmm? 
We, we plugged it into this one to find the maximum height. Here we're trying to solve for t, to find out how long it takes to hit the ground. So I have this nice quadratic equation. How do you solve a quadratic equation? Do you want to factor it? I doubt it factors. So what's the other option? Quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. So you're kind of stuck plugging this into the quadratic formula. So t equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. What's b? What's b in this case? 400. 400. So that goes here and here. a is negative 16, c is 15, and negative 16 in the bottom. Ooh, what fun. Let's see if I can get this. So, oh, um, is it going to be the plus part or the negative part? Before you even start, it's better to find out which one's going to work. If it's the plus part, it will be a positive number on the top and a negative number on the bottom. Does t mean anything if it's negative? So more than likely, it's going to be the minus part, but it would be a negative on the top and a negative on the bottom. It will give you a positive answer. So negative 400. Oops. Negative 400 minus the square root of 400 squared minus 4 times negative 16 times 15. Answer. Divide by negative 32. 25. Approximately 25 seconds. So you have about a half a minute to get the heck out of the way before you die. From shooting a bullet straight up in the air, which is probably the silliest thing to do in the world. That's it. Pretty simple question. So when does it get hard? If I do ever ask this on the test, I have to give you this formula. You just have to know how to use it. And you have to understand that it is a parabola, and what you're looking for are usually x-intercepts in the vertex. So what's the other type of word problem that I would like you to solve? Well, Farmer Joe. Let's see. Bless you. I think. <laughs> Farmer Joe has fifteen hundred feet of fence. And wants maximize a pasture. Is that spelled right for pasture? I don't think so. You know, like a cow pasture? Really? It doesn't look right. And wants to maximize a pasture for his cows next to a river. So basically what we want to find out for Farmer Joe is um, we want to find the dimensions of that rectangular field that he's going to design next to a river. Now, the other assumption is his cows can't swim. They'll drown if they go in the river. So. He doesn't need to fence the riverside. So whenever you're confronted with a problem like this, what's the first thing you do? Draw a picture. River. Isn't that a pretty river? Cows can't cross it. Fence. They can't swim. They're dumb cows. Huh? They can go in it, they just can't swim in it. This is a very deep, fast-running river. Just give it, give me the, the leeway yeah, on this one. Dumb cows, probably <laughs> drown. So he's going to build his fence rectangular, but missing one of the sides, the side where the river is. He wants his cows to be able to at least get to the water to drink. He doesn't want to fence it away from him. Hopefully, it doesn't flow. So what do I know about this rectangle? Absolutely nothing. Well, not exactly absolutely nothing, but what's its length? So what do you call it? X. 
what's its width? Can't be x because then it would be a square, and I really don't want a square. So what can you call the other side? Y. Why not? So I know it's an x by y enclosure. Now there's two things going on here. We want to, where is it? Oh, I forgot to say it. Maximize area for the pasture. If you're going to maximize a pasture, it's the area that you're talking about. And the other thing he has is 1,500 feet of fence. Well, if it's 1,500 feet of fence, that's just where these black lines are. That's 1,500 feet. And the area is what's contained within the black lines and the river. So when we talk about the black lines, it has a fancy name called perimeter. And of course, the other one is called area. Which one do I know more about, the area or the perimeter? The perimeter. So the perimeter of this thing, in variable terms, no numbers yet, variable terms is what? x plus 2y. Now, do I know any of these numbers out of these p, x, or y? None of them? I know p. It's 1,500. So I can write this. This is 1,500 is equal to x plus 2y. This equation has a fancy name. This is called constraint. He only has 1,500 feet of fencing. He has no less and he has no more. He's constrained with this much fencing. If he had more fencing, he could contain more area. So that's called the constraint part of the problem. The other part of the problem is the area. How do I find the area of this uh, thing? This rectangle-ish length times width, which is x times y. This one is called the objective. And this type of problem is basically called a max-min problem. Max-min problem. So you're always given a constraint, and you're always trying to find this objective. We're trying to maximize that area. The problem is, I need to work with this three-variable expression. And we're used to only working in two, an x and a y, or you know, two different letters. So I need to use the constraint to reduce the number of variables on this side. So the object is, take the constraint, solve it for one of the variables. Pick one, I don't care which. Which one is easier to solve for in this equation? Seriously? <laughs> the x is all by himself. I would solve for the x. But you could solve for y if you really, really wanted to. So if you solve for x, what's it equal to? No. If I solve this <laughs> equation for x, no. 1,500 minus 2y. Oh, yeah, I swear. If you're trying to solve for x, you leave him there, okay. and you subtract him over. Um, it doesn't matter, because 5 minus 2 and 2 minus 5 are two different numbers. Okay. I'll so, miss this one. Oh, can you <laughs> <laughs> 1,500 minus 2y. All right, and then you take this, and you substitute it into the objective. In other words, wherever you see an x, you're going to replace it with 1,500 minus 2y. So this equation becomes a equals, wherever you see an x, you replace it with 1,500 minus 2y. So now we get an area function in terms of the variable y. An area function in terms of the variable y. We don't have that multivariate weird thing going on. All right, distribute the y, and you get a, the area, is equal to 1,500y minus 2y squared. Okay. So our objective is now a function in terms of one variable rather than two variables. What does the graph of this thing look like? The u thing. Which way is it facing? Down. Why is it facing down? Because of that minus in front of the y squared. 
So because this minus is here, this is an upside down parabola, and we're trying to maximize area. Well, where's... I thought also in the word problem where it's a maximize. I know, but it's better to know what the picture looks like, too. So you can go, oh, yeah, maximum. So where's the maximum on this thing? The very top. And that is called? Vertex. The vertex, again. So a lot of these max mins, um, if it's a parabola, it's going to be the vertex. It's going to be the vertex. So, how do I find the vertex of this little equation, function? What formula do I use? 2B something. 2B <laughs> or not 2B? Ah, uh, it's not 2B. Negative B. It's the quadratic formula without the square root part. Negative B over 2A. So, this, in, this one is going to be Y equals negative B over 2A. What's B in this case? Two. And 1,500. It's AX squared plus BX. So the single variable has the B part. The single variable is here. So it would be 1,500, negative 1,500, over 2 times A. What's A in this case? Negative 2. So it's 1,500 divided by 4. Better known as 375. So what is this telling us is the y variable has to be 375. And since we're talking about feet, the amount of fence would be feet. So this side is 375 feet. This side, how do I find x? Plug in y. Plug in y. Where? First to the first equation. So you get x is equal to 1,500 minus 2 times 375, better known as 15, no, 750. 750. And 1,500 minus 750 is well, 750. So x is 750. So this side would be 750 feet. So a farmer, oops, feet. If Farmer Joe made his fence 750 feet by 375 feet, where the 375 is the one touching the river, that would maximize the area for his little cows inside his pasture. Ta-da! And that's called a constraint objective type problem, or a max min problem. Want to do one more? Sure you do. Did I spell it wrong? Yeah, what? What? Male, female, and pups. Kennel, dogs, male, female, pups. I just didn't want to write it down. I'm lazy. Max, it my house because it's raining. Max, it my house because the kennel for my vacation. They put them in front of this big lab because it was the only one they had left. And I felt so bad for them. Because they were like two pounds. And that thing was like a hundred and something. That was a big dog. So the kennel is going to be designed like this, and you want to separate the males, the females, and the pups. So you want three different enclosures. Okay. So what do I know about this thing? Well, I know the blue parts of this are going to use up 800 feet of fencing. Do I know its length? So what do I call it? X. Do I know its height? No. no. Or width. What do I call it? A. I was about to say E. Oh, Y. <laughs> That's a similar. That's why I use X. That's why I use Y. Okay. 
Now, be really careful. This x doesn't represent these little line segments. It represents the distance from here to here, all the way across the bottom. So what is the constraint? Well, the constraint is 800 feet of fencing. So is that perimeter or area? What would area be measured in? Square feet. So you have to be careful with that. So this is 800 feet of fencing is going to equal, in terms of the variables, Telfair. What? I always go x this way because it's horizontal and y this way because it's vertical, but it's four. There's one y here, another one, another one, another one. So that'd be four y plus two x. One on the bottom, one on the top. So these are not perfect rectangles, which are 2L plus 2W. They could have multiple sides. So be careful. Why are you smiling back there? Every time I look at you, you're like, mm -hmm. like this <laughs> private <Wow>. joke. <laughs> so this is our constraint. Constraint. The objective is the other part of the problem that we're looking for. We want to maximize the area of this object. So how do I write the area of this object? You know, area is equal to length times width, in this case. What's its length? X. What's its width? Y. So you get this little setup. Exact same problem. It might look a little different, but it's the exact same problem. So what do I need to do to the constraint? Stop looking at me. <laughs> solve for which one? Two. You can't solve for two. X. X. If we solve for X, what's the first thing I move? Four Y. The four Y, so I get? A hundred minus four Y. And then you get x equals 400 minus 2y. And you take this thing and you plug it directly into that thing. So wherever you see x, you replace it with 400 minus 2y. So over here you get area is equal to, replace the x, leave the y. x times y. And inside the parentheses goes 400 minus 2y. <clears throat> so you get a is equal to 400y minus 2y squared. Oh, did I do that right? Yeah, yeah. 400y minus 2y squared. Now what? No. At what? Find the axis of symmetry. So take your quadratic function here, and you go y is equal to negative b over 2a. Let's see if we get it right this time. Which one's b? You be quiet. 400. So this becomes negative 400 over 2 times, which is? Negative two. Negative two. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this becomes a hundred. So if y is equal to a hundred, this would be a hundred feet for y. What is x equal to? Mm. When you come back over to the constraint, x is equal to four hundred minus two times a hundred, better known as two hundred. So if they make their enclosure 200 feet, that's what? That's right, right? 100, 200. So let's see, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, that would be 800 feet. That's a big kennel. Lots of puppets in there. Dog whispers kennel. Finally, dogs again. 